Well, um, the title of the message today is Building and Being Such a Body. Building and Being Such a Body. And you, in a sense, that's kind of a bad title, and this, you've got to bring with you to understand it other things we've covered in Ephesians. Such a body, as we've been discussing, this body that uh, God is building and establishing, realizing in the world through the gospel, Jew and Gentile united in Christ, one body unto God in the world, united in love to God and to one another, um, living as God would have them live in the world. So we're talking today about being, or sorry, about building such a body and being such a body. These are both, as I see it, our actions. Like, not that God's not involved, He certainly is, but these are our actions, our activities. This is what we find in the rest of the book of Ephesians. We've been, this is the third out of what will be four messages over this book. Um, and so, um, you know, we certainly could go through the book of Ephesians in a much slower fashion, and it's deserving of that, but I'm just trying to relate in these four messages the main emphases of this book and to do so in as helpful a way as I can. Um, just by way of review a little bit to see where we are and then where we're headed. Uh, in the first message, we saw that God's redemptive work uh, was a mystery that was not revealed before as it has been now. As the gospel spread throughout the world, the wisdom of God and the purpose of God became more and more evident. In addition to the revelation about this mystery that Jesus gave and that Paul himself also received from God. This mystery was made known in former times, but not as clearly as it has now been made known. Let's just go to Ephesians chapter 3 and read verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 1 through 12. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is, what is the mystery that has been revealed now that wasn't so clearly revealed before, but was discussed, but just not made evident? And Paul's going to lay it out very plainly that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which is given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that the result of this revelation of this mystery and making it clear and evident is so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So what we find in those verses is, uh, there's a lot that we find, but a couple things I want to just highlight on so we understand the magnitude of this. As Paul writes to this Ephesian church, he's telling them essentially, listen, God has begun a work in the world that was not known, clear, evident, obvious before. It was a bit unexpected, though we, we could read about it. But now it's been revealed, and it's happening in the world. And right now, God is realizing that purpose. It's, it's, it's really coming together. It's, it's a living reality in the world. It is the church. The unification of Jew and Gentile. The, the tearing down of this dividing wall of hostility. The unification of all things. The summing up of all things in Christ. This is happening now in this body. Paul goes to some town and proclaims the gospel, and some Jews are converted. The rest of them persecute him. He's run out of town. He gets word, Jew and Gentile are believing in Christ. This is this body. This is what's happening. 
this sort of thing. He spends years here in Ephesus proclaiming the gospel. And in Ephesus and in the surrounding region, as they hear this gospel and it goes forth, God's people are being called out of darkness in and into light, being made a part of this body, united in Christ. All those old distinctions are gone and done away as this substance of Christ is all in all to this people. As that happens, not only is it revealed to us and to people what the plan and purpose of God is, as it's understood particularly by Christians, but it's also revealed in heaven, right? He says, so that, verse 10, through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So right now, in heaven, God has something on display in the earth. He has a lot of things maybe on display, but what Paul's talking about here specifically God is displaying the church as it is even now, which is hard to believe in the sense that we might think God will one day display us as trophies of His grace when all sin is gone. Then we will be a trophy fit for heaven to gaze on, it seems. But even now, in fact, the church is on display in heaven as God reveals His manifold wisdom to the heavenly beings as He works in the world, creating, building, establishing, unifying, sanctifying His church. It's on display. Look at the wisdom of God. It's a present reality. Not just a, something that's going to happen in the by and by, but it's right now. It's existing. God is doing this. Verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that He has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's, it's actually here. It's coming. We are experiencing it. This kingdom of heaven that was coming and is now here. This is what we see. That was, in the first message, we kind of went through those first three and a half chapters and showed how this is the continual theme of Ephesians up until that point. This is the main thing. Look what God is doing in the world. Look what He's established. You have partaken in that. You are privileged enough to be in this. Glory in it. Delight in it. Don't be, uh, as he says in verse 13 of chapter 3, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory, right? I'm speaking these things throughout the world. They've locked me up, put me in a home, put me on house arrest, and I'm not free to go and proclaim this anymore. Society has locked me away. This is a message they don't want to hear. But don't let that, that discourage you. This is your glory. This is what God is doing in the world. Don't be ashamed. Don't lose heart. That was the first message. We paid very careful attention to this path. I used that illustration of a pathway, which we walked on during that first message, keeping our eyes always on that path. You might say listening to that drum beat all the way through, pushing aside whatever beautiful flowers were in the way so that we could keep our eyes on that pathway and just follow that theme and understand how central this is to what Paul says. Then in the second message, we retraced our steps, but this time enjoying the walk by grabbing these Beautiful bouquets of flowers that Paul has strewn about in these phrases all the way through there, which are incredibly rich, wonderful, wonderfully deep, and packed with theological truth. It's glorious things that he's saying, and he's just dropping these things everywhere. The first time, in order to understand his argument, we had to clear those things away. The second time through, we stopped and just said, are you seeing this? Have you heard about this? Listen to what he said over here. Oh, don't miss this one here. And we just kind of went through those first three chapters, seeing these many things that God has done for us. Um, these loaded phrases that Paul uses. This, these phrases are what many, what, what, why many people say that Ephesians is maybe the most theologically dense section in the entire Bible. It just is that way. In that message, we just marveled at, these incre at the incredible goodness of God to us in Christ. I'll just read just some of the things we considered. I, some of these will be ex the exact quote from Paul's phrase. Other times it's a, it's a rewording. But we've been elected unto holiness. As Christians, we've been adopted as God's children. We've been blessed in the beloved. We have redemption and forgiveness. It is to us that God's purposes and plans have been revealed. We are the inheritance of God. 
God has given us His Spirit. As a, He's not only given us the Spirit, but He's given us the Spirit even as a seal and a guarantee that He will come and redeem us. We have the hope of glory. Our, the eyes of our hearts have been enlightened. Think about that in terms of experience. The eyes of our hearts have been enlightened. There is immeasurably great power at work in us. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. What else? Christ is given to us as head over all things. God loved us. He gave us for our good someone who will rule everything for us. What a thing. We've been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms to somehow share some measure of His authority. We've been brought from death to life. The immeasurable riches of God's grace in kindness is on display in us. Think of that. God wants to show that He has something that is immeasurable. And the thing that's immeasurable is His grace. And He puts that on display by pouring forth kindness to you to prove that His grace is immeasurable. What a thing that happens in your life and in my life that's on display and will one day be on more full display. We are, as Christians, the very workmanship of God. We are also the dwelling place of God as a church. We are the demonstration of the manifold wisdom of God in the world. How could these things be? Each one of these is worthy of a lengthy study, but yet they're just thrown in here as he's making his argument. We might say, forget not all his benefits. Well, then, what are we doing this week? We continue to move through Paul's letter. As we do that, we see that he shifts. He moves on now to discuss the implications and the applications of such truths as this. Having received such truth, having been made into a part of such a body of people as God is creating in the world, what is our duty first to God and then also then to one another? Well, Christians are both individually and corporately as a group a people who have been brought back into proper fellowship and union with God. Now, we are going to read through and examine Ephesians chapter 4, but before we do, I want to kind of summarize the rest of what we see in Ephesians just so we understand kind of what the whole flow of things is here. So if we are a group of people that have, if we have been made a, a part of this church, this body that God is creating in the world. This carries with it certain expectations for holiness of life and for the priorities that we set in our lives, again, both individually and as a body, as a church. So there are great privileges, which we've read about and in, in, you know, we kind of summarized and we've considered it already in weeks ahead. But there are also solemn responsibilities which are upon us, which we'll con begin to consider now. And this is how Paul works it out in Ephesians. At first, in chapter 4, you might say chapter 4, verse 1, is something of a summary statement of the rest of the book, or the rest of the letter. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And everything else flows from that. What is our responsibility to one another as members of this body that is so precious to God? And this is how he begins. Simply stated, this is that for which Jesus died. Therefore, as believers, there must be a sacredness to that. When we think about the church, right? When we think about, as, just as believers, when we think about, well, what, what church will I become a part of? Will I, will I engage in? Will I invest myself in? It's not... There are, there are factors that factor in here, and one of these things ought to be some, some sense of reverence and sacredness to what this thing is of the church. There ought to be, he says, an eagerness in our hearts to preserve this unified body in love to God, in love to one another. This is the thing for which Christ died. This is the mystery about which He has uh, now been revealed. This is this Purpose of God. This is the thing which God puts on display to highlight His character and His goodness. This unified body living in holiness and in love to Him and love for one another. Therefore, as we rub against one another as believers and we have disagreements or problems, we ought to, be, we ought to handle those things in a certain way. 
We ought to be eager to maintain this unity. This is not easily done, but it's the first and most pressing duty which comes to Paul's mind when he considers that what God is doing in the world in the church. This isn't easy. It requires, what does he say? With all humility and gentleness, with patience. Right? This re- it requires this. Humility, gentleness, patience. And what are they to do? Two commands. Bear with one another in love. And be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So bear with one another in love and make every effort to keep the unity. This is the first thing he says. Walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Namely, what? Bear with one another in love and make every effort to keep this unity. And that won't happen, right, apart from humility, gentleness, patience. What else? The church, then, is the very masterpiece of God's goodness and His grace. The demonstration of His uniting all things together in Christ, right? We can talk about that one day will be everything united under Christ. We will see that one day. Corinthians, Paul talks about it in, in 1 Corinthians, that one day every enemy will be defeated. Death itself will be defeated, and Christ will unite turn everything over to the Father, and God will be all in all once again. That's going to happen. But even right now in the church, there's a demonstration of what that might look like. All things united under Christ. This unity under Him. Therefore, the church even now ought to reflect that unity as much as possible. Believers are to strive to maintain that unity under Him. Consider that while also that while the future destiny of the church is spotlessness and complete sinlessness, none of us are there yet. In the meantime, between our being saved, our initial salvation, and, and having been made a part of this body, between that time and our final redemption at the Lord's return, we have this incredible job to do. We are to mature and grow and walk in a manner worthy of our calling. There's a high calling then to pitch in and do our part, not only to reflect God's character and life in our own lives, but also to help others in the church to do so as well. In order to accomplish this, what has God done? God has not only called us to Himself, but He has enriched us with gifts especially intended for the task of bringing spiritual health and vitality and maturity to the church. So, I mean, imagine if, I mean, can you imagine if there were no spiritual gifts? And the command came upon you to walk worthy and build up the body into the mature manhood of Christ. Grow as saints. And there's no supernatural ability to help us with this. This is doomed to failure. But God has given us this command. He's put this expectation upon us. We are to build one another up, to help one another along. Not only am I to look out for my own life, that I would be growing in holiness, but I am to do all I can to see that this body grows and matures in the Lord. You are to do the same. We are all to do this. And thankfully, when He gave us this command, He also gave us gifts to enrich us that we might be able to contribute to this task and this effort of spiritual growth. That brings us all the way down then, again, in summary fashion, down to verse 16. Now we start in verse 17. Then Paul continues, again, we're going to go back and look at chapter 4, but... Then Paul continues by addressing some fundamental differences which must mark out believers in the world. As believers, we are to maintain the unity of God's people. We're to labor to build up the rest of the church, however we may. And now we're also, he says, we are to walk a new kind of life. Verse 17, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Right? Right? How about verse 22? Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. Right? There's a change. There's something transformed. Verse 24, put on the new self. Verse 25, therefore having in the past put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You see, all the way through it, in, in verses 17 through the end of chapter 4, it's all about this contrast. This is what your life was, but that's, 
Something's different had happened. You've been saved. You've come to know God. You've been delivered. God's changed you. He puts you into this body. Therefore, you can't walk that old way anymore. You've got to walk according to what God is doing in you in this new life. You've got to put it into practice and walk it out. Then in chapter 5, we read, not only are we to, to, to have a new kind of life, but we're also, we, we should think about this new life as being imitators of God. As beloved children, we are to imitate God's character and His love, especially the sacrificial love of Christ. Our conduct as we imitate God should be characterized by love, by self-sacrifice, by a Godward aim, by this desire to have conduct that is acceptable to God. Such conduct, what does that look like, is characterized by Paul in a series of contrasts throughout chapter 5 with occasional additional comments. Let's just consider like chapter 5, verse 3. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place in the contrast, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Explanation. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, and it, it, we come, even his explanation has contrast. You may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, which it, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate them with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So you see these contrasts going on throughout chapter, the first part of chapter 5. But this conduct is not limited just to our public life or, or to our, even our corporate life as a church, or our public life as citizens. It's far beyond that. To every relationship and every role we might have in any part of our life, our whole life, everything under the sun, is to be a fragrant offering to Christ. And in this effort, the believer must come continually to the light of God and must make sound use of their time in the world. They must fill their hearts with the knowledge of God, being filled with the Spirit, they should have, there should be a thankfulness to God in their hearts, a giving deference to one another out of reverence for Christ Himself. That works itself out. This deference to one another out of reverence for Christ works itself out in all of our relationships. Husbands and wives, children and parents, slaves and masters. No relationship is exempt. No relationship, no role is outside of our service to God or is outside the scope of the obedience He came to obtain in your life. He didn't come that you might get better here or there or this part or that part, but all of life would recognize Christ as Lord. Husbands would, would then, in looking to Christ as our Lord and in reverence for Him and by learning from Him, what would happen? They would learn to love their wives. Wives would learn to submit to their husbands. Children would learn to obey their parents in hope of a glad and a blessed future. Parents would learn to raise glad and godly children. Slaves would learn to sincerely serve their masters. And masters learn to govern without evil threatening. This is the letter to Ephesians. Now, Ephesians chapter 4. Two main points. I said building and being such a body. So there are two points. Building such a body and being such a body. So those are the headings that, as I see it for Ephesians chapter 4, and we're just going to work through that chapter considering those things. First of all, building such a body. So as we talk about this, maybe before I go into that, for that heading, building such a body, just this idea of such a body. We can't, we can ever, we're going to miss it if we ever get far at all from thinking about the kind of body we're talking about. A body that's unified under Christ, that's united to God, that walks in love for one another, that, no, that, ex, that walks out in a real holiness of life. Righteousness is really a part of things. A concern for God is paramount and primary. If that's, that's the kind of body we're talking about, we're talking essentially about bringing people back to God like things were in a sense in the garden, where God is honored as King. And man has fellowship with him and with one another in an open way. 
This is what we mean. This is what is God is doing in the world, in the church. Now, so if we're going to build such a body as that, that, you know, when you set out to build, if I was going to build a house, we would want certain tools. If I was going to build a skyscraper, we would need other tools, bigger tools, stronger things, stronger materials. We need something great. God can't build this body apart from remaking people. Right? We've got to be made totally new. He's got to change and transform us. He also has to give us tools that are effective for building. And this is what He does. This is what spiritual gifts are. He's told you to go start building this building. Start making it better, making it more like He intends it to be. You can't do that on your own. But He's given you these tools. Right? I, it's hard to... We've, we can go back and look and see in primitive societies the things people made when they just had their hands to make a, make a house. And we think, I'm glad I don't live there. Right? But when you start to have tools, now all of a sudden things can, get, things can really start to take shape and be quite a, a habitation. And this is what we have. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore, a pri- verse 1, I prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And we could say this all the time to one another, couldn't we? No matter what it is, I mean, whatever issue you're having as, as a Christian, whatever, wherever you're failing, we could, if we wanted, come to you and say, I'm urging you to walk worthy. You're living down here. Walk worthy. There's just so much more that's expected of you. This calling deserves so much more from you in this area or that area. Now, we, you know, a, a mean-spirited preacher could come and berate people with that. You're not worthy of this and that and everything else. But that's not the point. Calls, Paul is here. He spent three chapters filling your heart with the goodness of God. And I'm saying, now, don't just sit there and say, well, that's amazing. Let that fill your heart and give you motivation to say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do more. I'm going to live higher. And the first application for how believers ought to walk worthy is their great concern for the church as a whole. Because it's so precious to God. This is the main thing for God. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. What is that going to look like? Well, with all humility and with gentleness and patience, with those three things as key virtues in which you live your life, the flavor of your life is all humility, all gentleness, with patience. What are you to do? Bear with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Which means, necessarily then, when you see Christians who are short-tempered with each other, who don't bear with one another in love, who aren't eager to not cause division, they're not walking worthy of this calling. They've been called out of darkness into this light, into this body, but they're, they're causing problems in that body. That's not walking worthy. Not worthy. They're not there to cause division and stir up strife. This is precious to God. Walk worthy of this calling. Don't forget what God has done with you, where He's put you. Maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And there's the solution for it, really. I mean, now we can talk about things that might divide us, but for Paul in his day, the primary divisions he has in mind and has already been demonstrated in this letter is between Jew and Gentile. He's saying, don't let this, don't let the, The the cultural differences between Jew and Gentile that have existed for thousands of years and in this place for hundreds of years in this city, do not let that be the thing that causes slowly the church to kind of break apart. It's just hard. It's hard to be together because there's all these cultural differences. We're constantly bumping into each other and having problems. We accidentally offend people because we didn't know this or that or whatever else. It's constantly happening. We're constantly causing offense to one another, sometimes purposely, sometimes accidentally. What do we need to do? We need to repent of those things We need to, when they're purposeful. When they're not, we need to realize what's happened. Make an effort to maintain this unity. Because there's just one body. 
Christ didn't create two bodies. The mystery was, maybe some people would have preferred that, but guess what? He's making one body. And so this is what's necessary. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, and here it is, who is over all and through all and in all. You say, well, I, we can't get along with that person. I can't follow what they're saying. There's one, one who's over all. Can you give allegiance to him? Do it for him. He's called you to this. It really doesn't matter. He expects you to have to bear with them. That's part of what he's called you to. Bearing with them with all humility and gentleness and patience. You say, I can't do it. Well, have you yet demonstrated all humility, all gentleness, all patience? Bear with one another in love. Eager, being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one who's over all. Serve Him. And through all. And in all. Right? God is working through them. And He Himself is in them. This thing that, that seems so offensive or just so off-putting about them. God is in them. Do you recognize? Do you see, what, where do you see God at work in their life? You see this appreciation for them as well. But grace was given to each one of us, all of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So not only did He, did he bring us and call us in, but when He brought us in, He gave us a gift. Therefore it says, when He ascended on high, He led a host of captives and He gave gifts to men. In saying He ascended, what does it mean but that He also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. That, verses 9 and 10, is Paul's defense of using what he quoted in verse 8 as a reference to Christ, having gone in heaven, led, cap led a host of captives, and gave gifts to many, saying, look, this is a reference to Christ. These, these phrases I've quoted from the Old Testament, and he argues for that in verses 9 and 10. And when it says he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also already, he had descended to the lower parts of the earth. He already come down. Now we're talking about his ascension. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now what had happened? And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now all this practical talk I've just been giving about getting along might make it seem like minimize the differences. And that's true. You've heard that rightly. You should feel that. Minimize the differences. Don't insist on your own way. But it doesn't take place in the context of just the absence of truth. In order to do this, what did he do? He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for, this work, for the work of ministry, or for this work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Listen to all this content he's talking about. Unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, the whole talk is about gaining knowledge, maturing in our understanding of the Word of God and the purpose of God and the mystery of God now revealed. We've got, to, we've got to know some things. And in order to build up the church and maintain this unity, God has given pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets to build up the church, to, or sorry, to equip the church, that they might build one another up. Which means I don't care what your gift is and how you might use it, you have to know some things to use it rightly. You can't just say, well, my gift is service. I'm just going to go start doing all these things. Fine, serve, but you've got to understand what you need to, 
you've got to get to the place that you understand what God's purpose is for the church so you know how to fit in. If you're just thinking, well, I just belong in this place called the church and I do my thing, that's not it. We are all united together in this purpose under God to build up this body into the thing He wants it to be. Every person in, that, in the service of that goal, that objective. He didn't give the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to go do their own thing. They've got a mission. Equip the saints for the work of ministry. So we don't get to just teach whatever, say whatever, do whatever. The things that happen from, from, you might say, from the pulpit or from those who speak and teach and pastor are meant to grade against your life, to rub against you, or also to build you up, whatever's necessary to equip you. What? For this work of ministry. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ. How long does this go on? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Right? We may, like, for instance, like in a church like this where it's been mostly the same people for a while now. We're all kind of, okay, we're growing in the Lord, maturing, and then some new convert comes. Or one of our kids gets converted. And they're, in a sense, in terms of their spiritual growth and maturity, they're way down here. Well, what do we just say? Well, leave them. We're, we're here. We're united. No, we go and we, we teach. We build up. So we all are at this point. We're, and we're not there yet, right? We've got to keep going. This is what we're after. The, the church of Jesus Christ is continually bringing in people at the bottom level and equipping and teaching and training and bringing them up higher and higher as we all are. We, the intention is growing and maturing in the Lord. This happens when? Or how, for how long? Verse 13 again. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, until we're like Him. Why, is this, this, why does this process continually happen? Why is it always at work in the church? So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Because, there are so, because this world is dark and full of false ideas and notions, false prophets, false teachers. Those who live in darkness but who open their mouth and say, I have light, and they're liars. They're just in ignorance. They don't know. Christians, we come, in, we come into this body of Christ having swam our whole life in that nonsense. And even now, as Christians, we rub against it every day. We hear these things all the time. What Paul is talking about in this section is the same thing he mentions in Corinthians. We have spiritual weapons to tear down strongholds. Those thoughts and opinions and ideas that people have set up against the knowledge of Christ, we tear them down, whether we find them in ourselves or in others. We exist partly as a body to tear those things down because if those things stand, we can't mature in Christ. We can't grow as we ought. It's necessary. Saints who don't know anything are not useful. To this purpose. God's purpose is to build up the church. If you don't know anything, you're far less useful. Now, I don't mean that every saint needs to know all kinds of things to have to be of any use. Brand new Christians, they know certain things, and they can be of great use in those things that they know. They've also been gifted by God for the building up of the church in all kinds of ways. And the more they learn, and the more they're willing to serve and to act in love for the saints, they will see that they effectively help build up this church. The work of ministry that Paul has in mind here, in this text, is the, the body building itself up. I don't mean to say that all ministry, all service that the church is involved in is just building itself up. But what Paul's talking about here, the work of ministry, is, look what it says in verse 16, or verse 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow, we all of us are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's the ministry he has in talk, he's talking about. 
here. The ministry that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4 is the body grows so that it builds itself up in love. Build up into what? Into the stature of the fullness of Christ. That in that this church here in Hannibal would be a living representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what? We are to be, part of our work together is to so refine and help one another that as a body we become a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is work. That requires bearing with one another. That requires being eager to maintain unity. That requires all humility and gentleness and patience. It requires supernatural giftings from God. It requires a commitment one to another. It requires a, a resolve to serve God in this way. It requires truth. It requires every part working properly to, to, in this effort. And this is necessary. And this is why Paul's praying that they would all have a knowledge of this mystery of what God is doing so they would all know what is our aim. We can all pull in the same direction if we know what this mystery is. What is the height and depth and how great which even surpasses knowledge is the love of Christ. If we know those things, we can pull in the same direction. Some people in the church, their job is to teach people what the direction is. Other people are to encourage you to pull harder. Others are to show you how to hold the rope, where to stand, what to do. Some are counting off when we, when we, when we pull, when we rest. Everybody's got a job. Now I use pulling in the same direction, but Paul's talking about building. And he could, we could use those illustrations if we wanted. He talks about a body having all of its pieces. How are you going to run a race with no leg? Right? It's not going to work. I mean, you could do it, but you're not going to run well. Right? You could hop through there, but it doesn't look like an athlete running. That's not what it's supposed to look like. God designed this thing better than that. It should function right. Building such a body. Building such a body. That's the first heading. Verse 17, here to the rest of the chapter. Being such a body. Now this I say, and testify in the Lord that you... How do we, so that's how we're going to build it up. How can we... But how are we going to live it out? Now this I say, and testify in the Lord. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. See why it's so important that all this teaching happen? That we speak to one another the truth in love? Because the Gentiles, they walk a certain way because of the futility of their minds. that are darkened in their understanding. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. The reason they don't live out the life God would have them live is because of this ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. It's not that there's no evidence. It's not that there's nothing, there's nothing at all they know about it, but because of their hard-heartedness, they don't embrace any of it. it doesn't, they don't think about these things in their mind. It doesn't produce any change. And they're alienated entirely from the life of God. They have become callous and have given themselves up, right, because of all this, to sensuality. They're greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you've learned Christ. That is not it, Right? They're alienated from the life of God. This is what characterizes their life. That's not at all how we learned Christ. And he says, assuming that you've heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. What? I mean, it's amazing. That's not the way you've learned Christ. And he just says, I assume, Ephesians, even though he had spent two years in Ephesians and he had taught them this, but many churches surrounding there heard about his ministry and churches had begun. And he says, my assumption is that you have heard, because you're churches of Jesus Christ, you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. What is that? To put off your old self. That's the operating assumption. If you can find a group of people who are Christ, naming the name of Christ, you ought to be able to assume about them. They've been taught to put off the old self. Not to walk in this old way. And he's saying, I'm telling you and reminding you again, put all that away. Put on your old, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and instead to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Have an understanding of what God's done for us in Christ. He's made you new. 
There was your old self, your old life, everything inside in your mind and your thinking and all that. And the life that those desires, that heart and that mind produced. Strip all that stuff off. Don't wear that anymore. Recognize you've been made new inside. So you don't have that old heart, those own desires. You might wrestle with some of those desires, but they're not your true desires at the base of who you are. You want God. God's made you new in true righteousness and holiness. That's who you are. Renew your, get all that other garbage out of your mind and renew your mind and build one another up in all of this. And now what? Now then put on this new self. Put on these deeds. This is what you've been taught. You've learned that when you became a Christian. This is what it is to live the Christian life. It's Christianity 101. If that's the way it is, what does he say, beloved? Verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood. Wait a minute. Does he mean no Christian has ever told a lie as a Christian? No. This is decisive thing that's happened. God's made you new. You've, you've, you've abandoned this life. You've converted. You've become a Christian. You're saying, this is, I'm going for God now. Well, then, you know what that means. You've got to take off that, I was a liar. You take that off. I'm not going to be a liar. I'm going to put on this coat that says, truth teller. That's me now. Because I'm walking for God. Therefore, having put away falsehood, since you've made a decisive break with that old life, let each one of you do what now? Speak the truth with his neighbor. For we're members of one another. Verse 26, Be angry and do not sin. Or literally, it's passive. Being angered, do not sin. Things will happen to make you angry. You'll get mad. Don't let that cause you to sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Isn't that amazing? It's one of the things he thinks about directly. I mean, it's not, we shouldn't be surprised. The kids shouldn't be surprised after this lesson on self-control. But this is the reality. Things will happen in your life that make you angry. And you feel justified. And you might be. But don't let even justified anger cause you to sin. Being angered, do not sin. That's radically different than the world. They get angry and always sin. Every time they get angry, it leads to sin. Which is why it's so dangerous to be angry. And for the Christian, he's saying, being angered, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't stew, don't let it fester. Give no opportunity to the devil. Which here I think, I think surely he's talking about relationally. Relationships go sour. Where someone gets angered and they just, they're angry, they just stay angry. They don't deal with it. Now, this is, an ex, this is not an excuse to deal with it with sin, right? It could be that way. I'm so mad. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this. I don't want to talk about it right now. We're not going to let the sun go down our anger. We're going to talk about it right now. Like, that's not it. That's not what we mean. That's sin. <laughs> right? Don't twist the word of God. Do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger. Both are commands. Don't just pick one. And give no opportunity to the devil. You see how those things, if being angered, if we're not walking with all humility and gentleness and patience, if I'm not willing to bear with you in love, but instead I'm just angry and then I act in sin, that's going to just... just Blow up this whole body of Christ where I am. Cause division. This is contrary entirely to this walk that is supposed to be worthy of this one calling to which we've received. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief, you say, well, I was over here, I I don't want people to know it, but I was a thief. Don't do that. Let the thief no longer steal. Rather, let him do what? Put on this garment that says, I'm a worker. I labor. I do honest work with my own hands. Why? Why? So that I can have something to share with anyone who's in need. What a thing. Not so that I don't steal. It's far higher than that. Far more than that. God has prepared for us good works, that we would walk in them. That thief, he's not just supposed to stop stealing. Let the thief no longer steal. Okay, not doing that. 
but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. What was it? His hands were busy doing what before? Stealing and taking. His eyes were looking to see who would see him. What can I, what can I have? What can I take for myself? This is what he was doing with his hands, but now no longer. He's not just supposed to sit on them. He's to put them into the use of righteousness. Doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So those hands which used to steal from others are now working, working, working. Providing benefit to others to earn pay. Then they earn the pay. And what do they do with the cash? They hand it out to other people who need. What a radical change and transformation of your hands. Right? Well, let it be so with every part of your body. Let no, how about the mouth? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. But only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, we could narrowly define corrupting talk as like foul language or something like that, but that'd be totally wrong. The way the language is described here, the talk that comes out of your mouth, is according to its effect. According to its effect. I could use beautiful words and entice you to something evil. That's corrupting talk. I can use foul words and urge you to something good, and it would, might be a net good, but it's still not great, <laughs> right? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Right? I've heard men swear and use curse words towards other men while urging them to write duties. Which is the case I would say, good direction, bad language. Right? We want good language, good direction. We want good results. Let nothing come out of your mouth that ends up corrupting. That's what we mean. But rather, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So take your words, your mouth. This isn't just for teachers. This is for all of us. This is part of the work of ministry. And it's part of just being a Christian in the world. When you speak, the result is people are helped, edified. Pointed in the proper direction. Built up in some way. Maybe encouraged. Maybe reproved. Maybe whatever. Maybe just there's just enough wholesome quality about the way you talk that it's just appealing. It's godly. It's virtuous. It's clean. It's pure. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Which would which would ought to define for us the kinds of things that we talk about, generally. Or if we have to talk about certain things which are, could be, be corrupting, we speak about them in such a way that doesn't lead to corruption. Right? There's a way to talk about sin which entices, and a way to talk about those same sins, even plainly, which does not entice at all, and, leaves, and, and corrupts no one. Right? Now, as I, say, as I say we're talking about results, let me be careful to say this. Paul in Romans 7 speaks about the law, which is good, holy, it's perfect, right? It's good, this good law. And it came, and it only says good things. It says, do all these good things. Don't, and don't do the bad things. And Paul says, sin within me heard, don't covet, and said, oh, covet. I like that. I want to covet. You could look at that and say, oh, well, if I go to someone, according to this verse here, if I say, don't steal, and then they steal, then it's, well, I had corrupting talk because I produced it. I spoke those words and they were corrupted. What we mean is, not, could it be that someone with a twisted, perverse heart could twist your words into a, something wrong? That's not what we mean. You're not responsible for that. But let your intention... And let, the, let a fair hearing of what you say be such that no one would say that's corrupting talk. Right? Give some attention to this. The wise ponder how to answer, right? Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We hear this all the time. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, and that's exactly right. We want to say that. But listen, think of this in the context of Ephesians. He mentions it here. 
<coughs> by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There was this promise Jesus Christ spoke, that He would pour out His Spirit upon His people. And, that, and the, the, the uh, Old Testament expectation is that in this new covenant, in this new people of God, the Spirit of God was going to move in and change and transform their lives. Make their hearts new so that they loved God. That having happened, there's this added seal also. I think that's the seal that's talked about, but there's more to it than that. It's also God is at work in us through His Spirit. The Spirit of God is upon us for tasks, for a changed life, for all of that. That whole package is part of this seal of God. It's God's mark, His signet ring, put in wax upon your life that says, this one's mine. They bear the mark of the work of God in their life. The hand of God is upon them. Puts that seal. And you go about your life with this seal upon you. And Christians recognize it and they see it. And the world sees it. And it's God's mark on you. And He sees it. And when He comes and when He returns, everyone, you've been sealed such that He recognizes this one has that seal. All the things that have been sealed have been reserved for Him. Special for Him to enjoy. They are His inheritance. These are mine. Right? I've purchased them. They've been waiting for me to come again. The seal, that mark, is the Holy Spirit's activity and work in your life. Don't grieve Him. Don't grieve Him. How, how would you grieve Him? This is the idea. The Son stamped your life with my presence. Here I am. To, inv to involve myself in cleaning you up and preparing you for Him. And if you live in such a way that you live against that purpose, it's such a grief. Can you imagine? I mean, if I... We were, we've been talking some about, uh, you know, because we were in Genesis. Think about Joseph. Somebody comes before Joseph. They got all, these grain, all this grain during the, months of or the years of famine. And they come and they purchase way more than they can take with them. And Joseph says, don't worry, we'll put a seal on there for it and we'll mark it out and that belongs to you. So when you come back, it's all there for you to have. Great. But what happens if in a year they come back and it's all rotted? It's such a grief. Or maybe there's some servant who's been put there to guard it while the master's gone. And he's looking at it and it's, it's just it's stinking, it's festering, it's terrible now. What a grief. My master purchased all this and he's going to come back and it's terrible. It's nothing like what he intended it to be. And that servant is so grieved by it. This is what it is. That servant was there to mark out and distinguish for everybody, this grain here belongs to this master, to my master. It's his. We purchased it. We're coming back for it. Well, the Spirit of God is the same way. He's there. These people are, belong to Jesus Christ. He's coming back for them. Look at them. And, he, and there's, a, there's a glory in it. He delights in us. And then he looks back and there's all this sin that he's been dealing with you on. And you, you, haven't, you haven't left it. And he says... It's a grief to him. He wants it. it used to be so much more. You could be more. You should be more. It's a grief to the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't do that. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. You see, our, it's not just that we're to be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. It's that we're to do all those things mindful of Christ's forgiveness of us. So when you're kind to another person, you don't just say, well, I'm just going to be kind to him." Like, you think, no, Christ was so kind to me. How kind can I be? How much can I demonstrate the kindness of God to them? How much can I reflect the character of my Savior who's been so good to me in the way I'm good to this one? There ought to be in every church lavish demonstrations of kindness and self-sacrifice and love and forgiveness all the time. Because we don't do these things as mere people, but as children of God. As God in Christ forgave us. That leads him right into chapter 5, verse 1, and we'll stop here. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Right? Imitators of God. Well, beloved, this is this, is this call. Walk worthy of this calling to which we have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Two things. Building such a body and being such a body. This is the so what, right? Of all these benefits, all these blessings, God's provided so much for us. He's doing so much in Christ. I mean, He's not just telling you, you've, we tend to think this way as Christians. Well, you've been forgiven of your sins so that you can have a relationship with God and you can go to heaven one day. That's not it. God's purposes are far bigger than that. They're far more significant even for you than that. Have an understanding of that, an appreciation of that. And that is part of, again, the fuel for this fire that is necessary that we burn in our lives, that we live in this way. Paul is just pouring fuel on the fire. He's got these Christians who love God, and in the first three chapters, he's pouring fuel on that fire. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6, he's saying, you keep blowing on that fire. Keep breathing on it. Live this way. Live hot for God. This is what it's going to look like in all these areas. First and foremost, we're to join Christ in building up this body, caring for this body. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like exercising these gifts in knowledge and in love. And it looks like personal holiness and righteousness. A true break with our old life and walking in newness of life. Amen. Are there questions or comments on any of this?